Hare Krishna. Jai Sri Ram. We're speaking on the evening of Lord Ramachandra's appearance day. I'm speaking, as many of you know, from the Hare Krishna school at Aryaskan a state outside of Auckland. Speaking about school, I just noticed in one of the classrooms a sign that says, one who dares teach must never cease to learn. Bhakti is always expanding and ever fresh. And it's amazing. As the years in bhakti go by, a devotee can look back and see, I didn't know anything last year. Each succeeding year becomes fresher and more illuminating. Whereas, what is material existence like? Each successive year is the same processing, reprocessing, like a rerun movie. Of course, this phenomenon is so eloquently explained by Srila Prahlad Maharaj, Puna Punas Charvada Charvana, chewing that which has already been chewed. Each successive generation does that. A theme that's been emerging in these talks is bhava and bhava. Bhava, the cycle of repeated birth and death. Bhava Sindhu, the ocean of samsara, repeated birth and death. And as we've been discussing, and I hope you have thought deeply about it, Bhava, repeated birth and death, is considered a disease, the most deadly virus. And Srimad Bhagavatam confidently, authoritatively, and most pointedly presents the cure to this disease. The process of bhakti, especially the foundational hearing and chanting about Krishna. For the past few sessions, we've been discussing the nature of material illusion, sometimes in specific reference to our current circumstances affecting the world. And then at the end, we try to discuss bhava and even venture into discussing the next stage, the condensed reality of bhava as praying. Tonight we're going to discuss what is it that a genuine government should do? We'll discuss Ram Leela. involving Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, um, involving, of course, the associates of Lord Ramchandra, as described in Ramayan and the ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And at the end, because as the sign on the school says, one who dares teach must never cease to learn, I'm going to reward myself and reward you by reading and discussing from Brihad Bhagavatamrita, the section that describes the wanderer, Gopakumar, departing Vaikuntha and going to Ayodhya. And then 
departing Ayoja to go to Dwarka. That'll be at the end. Don't miss it. At this point, I'd like to apologize for what happened on Wednesday. It's out of my control. Out of anyone's control, except the video game lovers of New Zealand. We started our class on Wednesday, 7 o'clock p.m. New Zealand time. And then I kept getting these messages while speaking that the internet connection was very bad. The connection was constantly going in and out. I didn't know what was going on because I'm on a fiber optic connection. Later, I found out that at the same time, 7 p.m., that I began my talk, one of the most popular video games in the world released its upgrade, which was a multi-gigabyte download. Call of Duty is the name. Some of our brahmacharis remember it from their previous days. Call of Duty. That's what ruined the broadcast. Although you'll still find, I'm told, the talk online uninterrupted. It's in two sections because once the connection finally recovered, I finished the discussion by going on for another three or four, five minutes. So all glories to Call of Duty. <laughs> of course, speaking about Bubba, repeated birth and death, we've got a complaint about what actually is perceived as Call of Duty. I remember during the GFC, the global financial crisis of 2008, a survey was done in the USA, which revealed that 65% of the male population there said, amidst an economic crunch, they have to give up something. They would rather give up food than to give up video games. 65%. Obviously, New Zealand is not exempt from video game mania. So therefore, Wednesday, everything crashed. The whole internet system in New Zealand was overloaded by 50%. Because everyone... All the video game lovers wanted to download the latest version of Call of Duty. Think about that. As bhakti yogis, Krishna conscious persons, aspiring to be Krishna conscious, our Call of Duty is much different. We serve Krishna out of duty first. And then, based on that Duty comes spontaneous attraction. In other words, our spiritual health starts to return. I always recall Srila Prabhupada's very concise definition of sadhana bhakti, devotional service according to rules and regulations. He said, sadhana bhakti means you have to do it because I say Simple as that. Devotional service performed under rules and regulations. Taking your medicine because the doctor orders and you want to become cured. But as your health returns, you start to become attracted to glorifying Krishna, engaging in Krishna's service. Your intelligence starts making plans how to serve Krishna better, how to associate with devotees more how to hear and chant with devotees and emulate their wonderful qualities. We 
You become less of a fault finder. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and we become like honeybees going for the honey. So duty in bhakti is very necessary, but it's not the ultimate. In any case, we have a disagreement with those who think the call of duty involves wasting their time in material engagements, even those deemed as so-called recreation, like video games. We've been talking about Pritchett Maharaj in his last days, just relishing hearing from Shukadeva Goswami about Krishna's pastimes. He's got a thirst to hear that. And he knows that thirst is the correct remedy for the disease of bhava. He knows I've got the bhava aushati, I've got the cure. And Shukadeva Goswami as we spoke Wednesday, compliments him. You are perceiving the Lord's pastimes as newer and newer. That shows you are wondrously situated. Now remember, Pritchard Maharaj, he's a suddenly retired government chief executive. By his behavior, even though he's retired, he's showing what is the panacea? What is the holistic cure for all the afflictions in the age of darkness, the age of Kali? In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Evam parampara praptam imam rajaseo vidhu. He spoke this Bhagavad Gita in parampara, chain of spiritual masters and disciples. And the saintly kings understood it in that way. The Rajarshis. Srila Prabhupada makes the point that this shows you something very important about the role of government. He explained in the purport that it is the main purpose of the executive heads of state to protect the citizens from material desires, especially those emanating as lust. Very interesting, isn't it? Who would ever think these days <laughs> that that would be the case? Can you imagine calling up your president, your prime minister, excuse me, if you could at all get through to the person? In New Zealand, it's possible. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, madam. How are you protecting your voters from lust? <laughs> People would think you're crazy. <laughs> Better the question they would think is, how are you rewarding your voters with more lust? <laughs> There's disagreement in political circles about the extent of the role of government. Should there be a, a lot of government or just a little government? Conservatives and liberals battle over this endlessly. Here in New Zealand, compared to other places, it's considered definitely left wing. The government should help people who are in a bad way, who are suffering. Whereas in other countries, depending on the dominant political party at the time, the idea is the government should be involved in everyday life as little as possible. Reminds me of a famous statement by one of the 
two-term American presidents about 25 years ago. He said, here are the nine most feared words in the English language. What are they? What are those nine words? I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. <laughs> in other words, the vision of those who think in that way is that governments just screw up everything when they try to do anything for the individual. Everyone should be an individual, make as much money as they can. If they can't make money, yeah, that's the way the cookie grumbles. Government services should be extremely limited. So what is our spiritual overview? Rather than argue about whether the government should be big or small, proactive or passive and detached, we should understand what a government should do. And in order to understand what a government should do, we need to understand what is the constitutional nature of the voters and the non-voters too. Because according to the vision of Srimad Bhagavatam, all living entities in a particular domain are citizens, not just the human beings. What should the government do? We can look at the example of Lord Ramchandra, who was like a father to his citizens. He didn't simply rule by decree, rule by enacting laws. He demonstrated and instructed how to be an ideal citizen. He trained the citizens how to live a balanced life all for the purpose of attaining spiritual perfection. So this is why the regime of Lord Ramchandra is so glorified amongst those in the know. We can get further elucidation about the Bhagavad Dharma vision of how a government should be by turning to the fifth canto and reading about King Gaia. We spoke briefly on Wednesday about how there's a bit of a tussle these days in terms of how to handle the approach to the coronavirus. If you shut everything down, lock down, the economy dives. If you try to keep the economy going by allowing a proportion of business as usual, then people's health suffers. So what do you stress? The economy or the health? Those stressing the economy, leaning more to that side, will say, well, look, while you're sacrificing the economy to protect the health, you haven't understood that people can die from economic collapse. They don't simply die from health problems. And then those leaning the other way toward health say, well, look, first let's deal with the health problem. That's the humane thing to do. And then we'll gradually try to bail out the economy. So to me, this is like, as I said Wednesday, arguing that I've got a tumor on my arm. Should the band-aid be lengthwise, in other words, vertical or horizontal? Whether you put the band-aid on the tumor vertically or horizontally, you haven't solved the problem. 
We need to know what is the purpose of a real government and what is the role of an ideal head of state. And Bhagavatam does speak about that. Let's hear about King Gaia. Shikadeva Goswami describes that King Gaia gave full protection and security to the citizens so that their personal property would not be disturbed by undesirable elements. So you see, a bhakti head of state is concerned about people's material well-being. Full protection and security to the citizens so their personal property would not be disturbed by undesirable elements. And he also saw that there was sufficient food to feed all the citizens. So all this protection in terms of health, security, property, food, that's considered poshana. What else would he do? He would execute something called Prinana. Sometimes he would distribute gifts to the citizens to satisfy them. What's more? He would sometimes call meetings and satisfy the citizens with sweet words. The Shastra says this is called Upalalana. And then he would also give them good instructions how to become first-class citizens. This is called Anushasana. So again, not simply passing laws, but training, instruction, how to make the most of your human form of life by realizing what its essential purpose is making spiritual advancement at least go beyond the platform of bodyism misidentifying the body as the self and then go higher to realizing our dormant connection to Krishna King Gaia demonstrated in several ways how to be an ideal person he was a householder. He executed all his grihasta duties in such a way that he was actually an unalloyed, pure devotee of the Lord. As a householder, he demonstrated how to live ideal household life. So that's number one, as a householder. Number two, as a devotee, he was always ready to give respect to other devotees while engaging in the bhakti yoga process. Always ready to give respect to other devotees. And then as a king, as a head of state, he gave the citizens all facilities. all facilities to have a secure material life for the purpose of advancing spiritually. So in this way, we get insight from Srimad Bhagavatam as to what the real standard of human life and human society is. And this is especially important to note on the appearance day of Sri Ram Chandra, who demonstrated how an ideal head of state views his citizens as his children and looks after them in that parental way. There's a big 
notion prevalent in material thinking that without emphasizing economic growth, people will claw each other to death. This notion is called the moral necessity of economic growth. It holds that only when people have a booming economy do the good qualities manifest. Charity, liberalness, concern for others, love your neighbor as yourself, mm. democracy, all these good qualities are fueled by money. And when the money dries up, that's when human beings get nasty and treat each other horribly, perpetrating atrocities like genocide. They leave themselves wide open for exploitation by dictatorships. So therefore the point is, got to keep the wheel of the economy turning. There's an old saying, and people sure act funny when they get a little money. The opposite also could be said. People sure act quite funny and dangerous when they don't have money. Just today, I saw a notice sent out by the Marketing Association of the USA as presented by a marketing industry media outlet called Ad Age. And these people were advising advertisers, marketing research people, you've got to get into it. You can't just fade away because of this great coronavirus crisis. You've got to keep your product in people's mind and increase the, the people's identification with your product, even through bad times. Use these bad times in some kind of way through appropriate advertising to elicit some kind of deep emotional response from your customers. Don't turn your back, don't run and hide. You've got to stay alive. You know how Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. Contemplating the objects of the senses leads to attachment. From attachment comes lust. So these marketing people are saying, you've got to keep that contemplation going so the attachment is not disturbed and the lust remains ignited. You don't want your product to disappear from the emotional life of the people, even in such a crisis. So Ad Age was quoting something they stated during 9-11. That crisis of yesterday. They said, the economic life of this country, a foundation of our well-being, cannot be put on hold. Consumers, already anxious about the economy, need to see that business is not retreating and that business is not uncertain. We spoke Wednesday about the Panchatattva. They're in the greatest business, plundering the storehouse of love of Krishna. That storehouse was sealed when Krishna came. But the Panchatattva appeared with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and just broke open the storehouse. And the more they tasted 
nectarian love of Krishna, the more their thirst increased. And the more they plundered the storehouse, the more the supply increased. And the more they danced and chanted, the easier it becomes for us to taste nectarian love of Krishna. And then we concluded by stating from Chaitanya Charitamrita that by the activities of the Panchatattva, the seed of material enjoyment becomes inert, impotent. And you may recall Srila Prabhupada's statement in the purport that within every conditioned soul is the seed of of serving Krishna, and undoubtedly there's also the seed for material enjoyment. But by the dynamic activity of the Panchatattva, the seed of material enjoyment becomes nullified, becomes impotent. As we discussed several days ago, there's always some concern. What practical effect will this kirtan have, this japa have, this bhakti yoga process? But let me tell you something. Right now, throughout the world, people are wondering what practical effect can we adopt that will remedy our situation? Health-wise, Everything is crashing. The economy is crashing. And then, don't forget, climate change. Just like in California, the golden state. It's been the seventh or eighth biggest economy in the world, just the state of California, not the whole USA, just one state, California. They're wondering, are we going to be hit with a one-two punch or a three punch? There's a coronavirus and there are bushfires, wildfires. But also, easily there could be coronavirus, wildfires, and drought. All coming at once. This concern, and as bhakti yogis, we're definitely concerned. We're not closing our eyes to the suffering of the world, but we just happen to know what the solution is. And at first, we have to seriously apply that solution in our own life. So the world is at a very critical point in which people are starting to think. And remember, as I explained some days ago, Bhagavad Gita actually begins at the point of material perplexity. Arjuna's material intelligence had shut down, locked up. When he dropped his bow and sat down in his chariot, depressed, crying, saying, Govind, I shall not fight. He had exhausted all material calculation, all material analysis. It's at that point that Bhagavad Gita starts to roll. So that's the world of Bhava, but also in this world is the opportunity for Bhava. Sri Ramchandra's appearance day. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was touring South India and he came upon Ramdas Vipra, who's a Rambakta. 
He invited Mahaprabhu over for lunch. But Mahaprabhu was waiting and waiting and waiting. Where's the lunch? And then Ramdas Vipra said, Sorry, but we're in the forest. Lakshman hasn't come back yet with vegetables and herbs for Sita Devi to cook. We have to wait for that to happen. Lord Chaitanya immediately understood this spontaneous method of worship, of devotional service. And he approved of it. Lunch wasn't served till 3 p.m. The Brahmana, Ramdas Vipra, would meet. And Mahaprabhu asked him, aren't you going to take something? No, no, I cannot eat. In fact, I'm about to end my life by entering either fire or water. I can't get over how Sita Devi, the consort of Lord Ramchandra, was touched by Ravana. The thought just burns me to ashes. So as you know, most of you, it's a famous Leela from Chaitanya Charitamrita. Mahaprabhu explained to him that Ravana never touched the real Sita. He simply grabbed, he simply kidnapped a material form that resembled Sita. What we want to focus on right now is some essential tattva, scientific knowledge of the Supreme that Mahaprabhu imparted in this situation. <clears throat> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu continued, Sita Devi the dearmost wife of the Supreme Lord Ramachandra certainly has a spiritual form full of bliss. No one can see her with material eyes, for no materialist has such power. To say nothing of touching Mother Sita, a person with material senses cannot even see her. When Ravana kidnapped her, he kidnapped only her material illusory form. As soon as Ravana arrived before Sita, she disappeared. Then just to cheat Ravana, she sent an illusory material form. Let's meditate on this. It was not possible for Ravana or any materialist to even see the real Sita Devi. What to speak of touch her? This point of tattva corresponds to what I consider an essential point of bhakti epistemology. How do we know what we know? That essential point is that Vedic knowledge and especially bhakti knowledge, knowledge of the Supreme Personality God, it is state specific. According to your state of consciousness and its purity, you'll perceive differently from someone else. This is explained in Bhagavad Gita. Chibir, Gunamaya, Bhava. The three modes of nature. According to our situation in those modes of nature, we see a certain way. If we want to see the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita, Our consciousness has to be situated a certain way. If we spoil our consciousness, if we pollute our consciousness, then we don't see what someone else can see who's properly cared for their consciousness. Just like the deities, for example. I've asked my esteemed scholarly godbrother, Krishna Shetra Swami to please 
write a book for the generally educated person explaining the whole science of the deity. Because especially for persons coming from a Christian background, oh, also from an Islamic background, there can be some kind of obstacle, some kind of impediment. Isn't this idol worship? So I've asked His Holiness Krishna Shetra Swami for the BBT, please write a catchy small book dispelling these fears. And yes, he's already begun that. When we see the deity, we're not seeing the same as when someone with material vision sees the deity. As Srila Prabhupada will often point out, here you are, intelligent Western persons. He's complimenting us, calling us intelligent. Intelligent Western persons bowing down on the floor to a stone statue. Oh, come on now, what's going on here? <laughs> he would provoke us in that way. We're bowing down. We're dressing the deities. We're singing to the deities, dancing in front of them. They're our life and soul because our vision is different whether you face that fact or not. <laughs> Otherwise, why are you doing it? <laughs> You're no fool. Just like the prasad. Everyone, mostly unless you're born in a family of devotees you've tasted food that's not offered to krishna why are we mad after prasad because krishna has accepted it krishna has eaten it that's why it tastes so different so we're readily acknowledging a different sensory experience because of having different consciousness I always remember walking around during dinner time at some of our outreach centers in Auckland and Wellington, the loft in Auckland, Bhakti Lounge in Wellington, and hearing people speak at tables while they're eating. What do they do? What do they do to the food? What do they put in this food? <laughs> it must be that mantra. <laughs> Sometimes I say that. I remember flying from Calcutta to Bangkok. And there was a businessman sitting next to me. He didn't speak for a couple of hours. And then suddenly he started talking. You know, I'm from the east coast of Australia. You guys have a few restaurants there. I do frequent them. Tell me. What do you put in the food? <laughs> Sensory experience is different. When what seem to be ordinary objects, ordinary substances become transformed by bhakti. So Mahaprabhu is pointing out an essential truth of Krishna Tattva, Bhakti Tattva. He says, spiritual substance is never within the jurisdiction of the material conception. This is always the verdict of the Vedas and Puranas. Always the verdict. In the purport we read, spiritual substances cannot be seen by the unintelligent because they do not have the eyes or the mentality to see the spirit soul. Consequently, they think that there is no such thing as spirit. But the followers of the Vedic injunctions take their information from Vedic statements, such as the verses from the Kata Upanishad and Srimad Bhagavatam quoted above. And you know how after Mahaprabhu left the house of Ramdas Vipra, he went 
further, farther on his tour of South India, and came upon some Brahmanas who were reading from the Kurma Purana. And there in the Kurma Purana was a section about how Ravana kidnapped an illusory form of Sita. So Mahaprabhu had them copy the palm leaves upon which the Kurma Purana was written. And he took the original back to show Ramdas Vipra. And Ramdas Vipra was so overjoyed. He had already accepted Mahaprabhu's explanation on the first visit. And now to have that explanation verified by Shastra, no doubt he was more than fulfilled. In fact, he tells Lord Chaitanya, I see that you are Sri Ramchandra. <laughs> of course, because Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. What about the so-called agony that Ramchandra and Sita Devi went through due to separation? First, the kidnapping. She's imprisoned by Ravana in Lanka. And then after the triumphant return to Ayodhya, Ramchandra does something baffling for, for many bhaktas even. Ramchandra did two things. He disguised himself and went throughout the, his kingdom to hear what the citizens are talking about. Sometimes big people do that. Bill Gates, one of the richest men in the world, founder of Microsoft, one of the founders of Microsoft. He says, I want so badly to be treated normally and to have some real friends that sometimes I disguise myself and go out into the city to cafes, pubs, just to mix with people in a informal way without their having to think, oh, it's Bill Gates. I want to hear what they're talking about. I want to hear what they're really thinking. So Ramchandra, as chief executive, the father of his citizens, wanted to make sure he knew what his citizens were thinking and talking. Of course, he's a supreme personality god at omniscient, but he's demonstrating how to be concerned about what the people are thinking. So he, in his rounds, incognito, he happened to hear some not very intelligent persons. Hmm. Dull-headed persons, we'd have to say. Gossiping. A husband telling his wife. You can do that unfaithfulness. You can disappear from home and be with another. I'm not going to accept that. I'm not like Ramchandra, who accepted Sita Devi back, even though she had been on the lap of Ravana for so long. I'm not like that. Also, One day, Ramchandra calls in Bart and asks, so what are the people talking about? And Bart looks down at the floor and is very sad. And he knows I can't hide anything from Sri Ramchandra. So he tells him he's noted the same thing, that low-class persons, ignorant persons, are gossiping. And they have a fear, the husbands have a fear, that since Ramchandra has accepted his wife back, even though she's unfaithful, we'll have to do the same thing. In this way, Ramchandra is going to be destroying our family structure and system and causing women to be unchaste.
At that point, Ramchandra, in a most decisive way, said, all right, she must go. He had her transported by chariot to the ashram of Valmiki Muni. She didn't know what was going on until the chariot was about to depart to go back to Ayodhya. And then she received the news. And she collapsed on the ground, wailing. At the same time, she said, I'll do anything to protect the honor of Ram. Anything. Still, she collapsed on the ground, crying. And as the chariot drove away to go back to Ayodhya, leaving her there, and remember, she's pregnant with the two sons of, the two twin sons of Ram, Lava and Kusha. As the chariot drove away, the chariot driver could hear her wailing and crying. She gave birth to those two sons at the ashram of Valmiki Muni. He had a ladies' ashram that he placed her in. She was there for 12 years. Until Ramchandra called her back. But her return lasted very briefly. after declaring her unending, unflinching love for Ramchandra, she entered the earth and disappeared, leaving a devastated Ramchandra. So now you're thinking, what's going on here? She was kidnapped and Ramchandra was devastated and he went through such an ordeal to get her back. Now she's back. Everyone's living happily ever after. Ramchandra is ruling Ayodhya. And then he sends her away. Even though she's expecting with his two sons. And then after 12 years, he brings her back. And then she disappears immediately in his presence. A chariot appears from inside the earth. She boards the chariot and the earth swallows, swallows him up. Why all this agony and pain? And so, indeed, sometimes our devotees, those who don't really understand the di inner dynamics, they get a little upset. What's Ram doing? Is he a masochist? Is he a misogynist or what? What about his family life? Mm. This is all about love and separation. I like Srila Prabhupada's explanation. Don't mind if I read it because you see these talks I'm giving are not simply a chance for me to teach, but also to learn. So I get my quota of hearing and chanting in also, you see. So thank you for indulging me. The situation of Lord Ramachandra is spiritual, for he does not belong to the material world. Narayana Parovyakta. Narayana is beyond the material creation because he is the creator of the material world he is not subject to the conditions of the material world. The separation of Lord Ramchandra from Sita is spiritually understood as vipralambha, which is an activity of the hadini potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, belonging to the Sringara Rasa, the mellow of conjugal love in the spiritual world. 
In the spiritual world, the Supreme Personality of Godhead has all the dealings of love. Displaying the symptoms called Sattvika, Sanchari, Vilapa, Murcha, and Unmada. You can find more about this in Chaitanya Charitamrita and also Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. These dealings of love. Thus, when Lord Ramachandra was separated from Sita, all these spiritual symptoms were manifested. The Lord is neither impersonal nor impotent. Rather, he is Satchitananda Vigraha, the eternal form of knowledge and bliss. Thus, he has all the symptoms of spiritual bliss. Feeling separation from one's beloved is also an item of spiritual bliss. As explained by Srila Srupa Damodar Goswami, Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikritya Haladini Shakti. The dealings of love between Radha and Krishna are displayed as the pleasure potency of the Lord. The Lord is the original source of all pleasure, the reservoir of all pleasure. Lord Ramachandra, therefore, manifested the truth both spiritually and materially. So materially, he's giving a lesson. You're going to be attached, you got to suffer. But predominantly, He's giving a message about the dynamics of the spiritual world. Love of love and separation, Vipralamba. In Ram Lila, in the relations between Ramchandra and Sita, you see that love and separation. Sporting in meeting and separation, you could say. And that coming together and separating magnifies, concentrates the whole loving affair. In material life, separation from the beloved is very agonizing. But in the spiritual world, everything is blissful. Meeting, separation. In fact, the separation is more blissful than the meeting because when you lose something, apparently, even for a short time, that's so dear to you, you just think about it even more than when you have it. <laughs> These dealings of meeting and separation, vipralamba, of course, are more pronounced between Radha and Krishna in the affairs between Radha and Krishna. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wants as a Supreme Personality of Godhead, to experience that. Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna Nahayanya. Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Radha and Krishna combined. The one Supreme Absolute Truth sometimes becomes two, and the two, Radha and Krishna, sometimes become the one, Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is the greatest mystery in spiritual life. At least we should recognize that. How can you not allow Krishna to have the full spectrum of loving dealings? People say about material existence, love makes the world go around. So how can you deny all the dynamics of loving affairs in Radha and Krishna or as manifest as Sita Ram. What is so enthralling, so demanding, so concentrated about material life, how can it not be there in spiritual life? Janmari Yasataha. The Supreme Absolute Truth is that from which everything emanates. Even meeting, separation, agony, ecstasy. But it's all blissful. It's all Satchitananda. Eternity, knowledge, and bliss. So Ramchandra is teaching us that in his affairs with Sita, his internal potency. 
which cannot be mistaken for anything material. The mistake is material life. The perfection is the spiritual life. So we began with bhava, and we're actually deep into bhava and beyond. I spoke in the beginning about you're indulging me in Brihad Bhagavatamrita. It's going to take some time, though, maybe about 20 minutes. I may have to skip your questions. I'll try for questions. But this is Sri Ram's appearance day. I hope we can invest more of our concentrated hearing. We're looking at a section of Brihad Bhagavatamrita in which it's described how the personality of Godhead becomes subordinate to his devotees. This seems contradictory. If he's self-satisfied, Atmarama, and independent, why does he need to be subordinate to his devotees? But that contradiction, that apparent contradiction, is very relishable for devotees. This is explained like that by Sanatana Goswami. <clears throat> First, we need to appreciate the exquisite rarity of pure devotional service, manifesting as prema bhakti, especially. As you know, Krishna gives both liberation and devotional service, but the point here is that he very rarely gives prema bhakti. Why? So rare. Some say Prema Bhakti makes him obliged to give up his independence because devotees who have Prem keep him helplessly under their control. Moreover, he's Bhagavan, that means omniscient, and he knows that it would be very haphazard very improper to give prema bhakti to anyone who's uneducated in bhakti rasa. You don't throw pearls out before fools. Cast them before fools. <clears throat> what about this? the Lord's coming under the control of his dear most servants. Why should there be unhappiness or fault in that? Actually, Sanatana Goswami explains, his doing so, coming under the control of his dear most servants, creates great joy. And it also broadcasts the glorious qualities of the Lord in terms of his affectionate concern for his devotees. So it's not that Krishna wants to avoid losing his independence. In other words, he's in a tight situation. These devotees love me so much, but I don't want to give up my independence. But <laughs> in material loving affairs, that duality is always there. I don't want to be in a codependent relationship. <laughs> or how about love at a distance? Or <laughs> on and on the concoctions go. The conclusion. <laughs> you hear in so many blues songs. Love is a hurting thing. <laughs> so it's not that Krishna wants to avoid losing his independence to protect himself from pain. When he submits to the desires of his devotees, 
He causes no distress for those devotees, and nor does he cause distress for himself. <laughs> In fact, as we sing during the month of Kartik, the Damodarastic prayers, by his coming under the control of his pure devotee, he brings joy to the whole world. And he shows the whole world how generous he is for his devotee. His submission to his devotees enlarges the stock of mutual joy. Joy for the devotee, joy for the Supreme Personality Godhead. And this submission is faultless. We spoke already briefly about what some people see as a contradiction. He's self-satisfied. Yet, he's coming under the control of his devotees. Does he need something? Is he lacking something? No, this is, as Sanatana Goswami says, the ultimate perfection of Godhead. This apparent contradiction is simply the mercy of Krishna. in love with his devotees. Then we have another issue about pure bhakti. Sanatana Goswami speaks. And yes, please note I'm reading from the BBT version of Brihad Bhagavatamrita, so eloquently prepared by the main stalwart behind it all, Gopi Pranana Prabhu, teamed up with His Holiness Jayadweta Swami and His Holiness Keshava Bharati Maharaj. A magnificent rendition. I call it the gold standard of translations and presentations. We read, In the final maturity of devotional service in pure love, Sometimes a unique treasure appears, Mahabhava, the highest stage of ecstasy. With the vision of truth, one sees it in the kingdom of the greatest delight, where it dances exuberantly upon the ramparts. So this most rare experience of Mahabhava seems to be about suffering burning in the fire of separation from Krishna. You see some of that in Ram's dealings with Sita, their separations. And of course you see it heaps in Radha Krishna Leela. So from the purely spiritual point of view, and that's the view we aspire for, this so-called suffering is actually the most sublime ecstasy. There's a problem, though. Sanat and Goswami goes on to explain. And yet the peculiar nature of Mahabhava is that outwardly it shows the signs of terrible distress, sorrow, and pain. And although these signs are but external, the Lord cannot tolerate seeing such a state in his most beloved devotees. So even though Krishna knows this Mahabhava is not material suffering, not material unhappiness, still he can't bear to see his devotees crying out to him pitifully, shedding torrents of tears. And so he's forced to respond. I was thinking about this today while chanting my expanded number of rounds for Ram Chandra's appearance day. Lamenting 
when can I cry out to Krishna? Overwhelmed with feelings of his absence. A real devotee manifesting genuine signs of distress impels the Lord to respond. as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so appropriately stated, presenting himself as a, as an aspiring devotee. He said, if you see tears in my eyes while, while I'm chanting Hare Krishna, you should know it's just a show. It's drama. Because if I actually loved Krishna, I would have died long ago from separation. I wouldn't be able to live if I actually had love for Krishna. So the problem that Sanatana Goswami is highlighting is that here, when persons addicted to mundane vision see the bewildering symptoms of ecstasy born from pure love of God, they ridicule the devotees because such mundane persons have no desire to achieve devotional service. The Supreme Lord withholds from them his prema bhakti. Hmm. You can think of some examples of misunderstanding. <clears throat> Kolavacha Sridha in Mayapur. Remember? He was very poor, apparently. Although Mahaprabhu insisted, you're such a rich man. You're so wealthy. I know you can't fool me. In other words, you're wealthy in pure love of Krishna. <clears throat> Kolavacha Sridhar would chant at night, crying out to Krishna. And all the neighbors thought, what is this? What a disturbance. He's so poor, he doesn't have anything to eat. He's crying out because he's hungry. And then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself in Varanasi, speaking to Prakashananda Saraswati and the Mayavadi Sannyasis, they asked him, what's all this sentimentality, this fanaticism expressed through chanting and dancing? And then Madhavendra Puri, when he, he was about to leave this world, He's crying out, oh, I could not attain Mathura. I could not attain my heart's desired destination. And Ramchandra Puri didn't understand, didn't have a clue. He said, what is this lamentation? You're supposed to be a self-realized soul. Nasochati, Nakangshati. No lamentation, no hankering. This is impersonalism. He didn't understand his guru's absorption in ecstatic love for Krishna. <clears throat> So this is why bhakti is a mystery. And this is the miracle of Sri Tadanya Mahaprabhu. What Krishna didn't give, that same Krishna comes as Radha Krishna combined and gives everyone a chance to drown in pure love of Krishna.
So looking at the clock here, you may have to get to Gopakumar and Ayodhya another night. <laughs> What do you think? Questions or Ioja? <laughs> Let's see what we can do here. I'd like to go to Ioja. On Ramchandra's appearance day. Narada Muni is explaining to Gopa Kumar, I can't understand the ecstasies of Prem. That's his humility. Narada Muni, although an intimate associate of Lord Narayan, can witness Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, Mathura, and Dwarka. And Gopa Kumar was born in Gokula graced by the mercy of Sri Gokulanath. So you have an ideal combination. Narada Muni is speaking about these exquisite states of bhakti in which the Lord becomes subservient to his devotee. And speaking about how Materialists can misunderstand this. Like who would want to put themselves in such a situation of agony? So they don't think like that. The Shastra keeps it hidden. And Krishna keeps that jewel of pure bhakti, that chintamani of pure bhakti hidden. Otherwise ordinary people make a mess of the situation in terms of their understanding. Look at these bhaktas, they're going through such agony and they're criticizing our material happiness. Look what they go through. We discussed the other day about a verse in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu where Rupa Goswami explains that it's very difficult to understand someone who is in ecstatic love for Krishna. And that point is repeated in Chaitanya Charitamrita. By Gopa Kumar's hearing the words of Narada Muni, he felt an increased desire to see his worshipable Lord Gopaladev. A storm like hope arose in him. And this hope put him in an ocean of sorrow. That ocean of sorrow is not material. So now Narada Muni is reciprocating by telling him something very confidential. He says, by the weight of your anxiety, Gopakumar's anxiety, I'm forced to speak openly about this. What I'm about to say actually is generally not discussed even in Vaikuntha. Now he's going to give Gopakumar directions. Leave Vaikuntha and go to Ayodhya, which is far from here. And beyond that, Ayodhya is Dwarka. And Dwarka resembles Mathura. He's pointing out the way to go higher and as you know, Gopa Kumar eventually winds up in Braj with his worshipable Lord Gopaladev. Narada Muni wants to teach him 
how to approach Ayodhya by explaining to him methods that are approved by those who whose only taste is for the service of Lord Ramachandra's lotus feet. In other words, Gobakumar, before you reach Dwarka, go to Ayodhya. Because the devotees in Ayodhya worship Lord Ramchandra almost as intimately as Krishna's devotees worship Krishna and Dwarka. And we're not yet speaking about Braj. The idea is that in Ayodhya, Gopakumar will get good training in the higher practice of personal devotion. There's no contradiction. Gopakumar is a devotee of Krishna. Yet, devotees of Krishna will see in Lord Ram many of the all-attractive features of Krishna. Just like when Ramchandra would enter the Dandakar on your forest, his lotus feet were pierced sometimes by thorns. So his devotees pray that he would place those same lotus feet in their hearts. So they can always think of him. That reminds you of a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam where the gopis are in distress during the day thinking of how Krishna is wandering in the forest with feet so tender that if a leaf touches them, the feet turn colors a little bit. They're thinking those lotus feet are being pricked by stones and twigs and pebbles. So you see some similarity. Narada Muni is simply wanting to help Gopakumar achieve his Gopala Dave by learning something about the worship of Lord Ramchandra. And we'll hear a deeper explanation why that is so. Narada Muni explains that persons exclusively devoted to their object of worship should be very much attracted to anything in which they find even a faint scent of their deity's presence. In other words, Gobha Kumar, this will help you in your spiritual self-interest. You'll find some strong traces in Ramchandra that are there abundantly in your Ishtadev, your worshipful Lord, Madan Gopal or Gopaladev. By doing so, you won't violate your chaste vow to worship your Lord Gopaladev. As the commentary explains, no. Because a devotee fixed in exclusive devotion to his Ishtadeva will be spontaneously attracted to whatever has even a slight fragrance of his own Lord's presence. Narada is confident that meeting Lord Ramachandra will lead Gopakumar to the perfection of happiness. See, guidance is so important in spiritual life. Who would have thought that Making a stop in Ayodhya on the way from Vaikuntha to Dwarka would be so profitable for a Krishna Bhakta who's attached to Braj. So Narada Muni assures Gopakumar that after you've seen the two lotus feet of Sri Ram, he'll notice that you're hankering. To see your Lord, Madan Gopal, is unappeased. And because he's so overflowing with compassion, he'll happily send you to Dwarka. So on your way there to Ayodhya, perform Harinam Sankirtan, glorifying Lord Ram as the husband of Sita Devi, Sita Pati as the older brother of Lakshman, 
as the beloved master of Hanuman. Sing those names. Small point emerges. Doesn't Gopa Kumar need to take permission from Lord Narayan to leave Vaikuntha? Narumi says, mm, no. Actually, he says, Ayodhya, Dwarka, and other such abodes are all regions of Vaikuntha. Surely, therefore, you need not take permission from the Lord of Vaikuntha to leave and go there. All these places belong to the greater kingdom of Vaikuntha. You're not going outside of Vaikuntha. Still, Gopal Kumar might be thinking, although I'm not going outside Vaikuntha, I just want to confirm with Lord Narayan that my journey is proper. But Narada Muni informs him, by the order of Lord Narayan, I've come here to see you. He knows I'm going to tell you these things. In fact, he requested me, please meet Gopal Kumar in a private place and fulfill his desires. He knows that Gopal Kumar is not satisfied fully living in Vaikuntha. He's a Braj Bhakta. And so he sent Narada to encourage Gopal Kumar, move on. And Narada Muni tells him, in any case, the Lord, Lord Narayan has gone somewhere else to bestow favor on one of his great devotees. You'll be unable to tolerate waiting for him to return. So now's the best time to go. Gopal Kumar might say, but I'll just wait for him to come back. But Narada Muni counters. Now that could be too long because... He could be so attached to bestowing favor on this beloved devotee. So he, take my word for it. Better you go now. You won't have the patience to wait until he returns. Also, Narada Muni knows that if Gopal Kumar does wait all this time to consult Lord Narayan in person, overwhelmed, He'll be overwhelmed by the majesty of Lord Narayan and he'll lose his desire to move on. And he won't. That means he won't achieve his goal. So Lord Narayan, knowing all this, is showing mercy to Gopal Kumar by saying, fulfill your desires, your spiritual desires, by moving on. You're not a Vaikuntha man. And Narada Muni wants Gopal Kumar to stop off in Ayodhya. Check it out. It'll help you in your bhakti because in Lord Ram you'll see traces of Swayam Bhagavan, Madan Gopal, Gopaladev. So Gopal Kumar bowed down to Narada Muni and remembering his instructions, departed. Or Ayodhya, also known as Koshala. Biha Bhagavatamrita says, After traveling a long way, I saw some forest monkeys restly, restlessly jumping here and there and shouting, Ram! Ram! <laughs> As I moved closer to them, they tried to grab my flute from my hand. In case you don't know, Gopal Kumar is always dressed as a cowherd boy. As a cowherd boy, he carries a flute. But the monkeys tried to grab that flute. <laughs> Why? Perhaps the commentary says they couldn't bear that Gopal Kumar was a devotee of someone other than Lord Ramchandra. Or maybe they were extremely attracted to the flute. Not only did Gopal Kumar see monkeys, but he saw some humans more beautiful than even the associates of Lord Narayan. And that has to be something, because the associates of Lord Narayan 
have the perfection of sarupya. They're sharing the same form as the Lord. They're four arms. Gopakumar was treating these persons with such great respect, but they didn't like this. They couldn't tolerate it. In other words, in Ayodhya, things aren't as stiff and formal, shall we say, as in Vaikuntha. It seemed obvious that Lord Ramachandra had sent these devotees out of the city to meet and greet Gopakumar. Because otherwise, these devotees would have never ventured so far away from the lotus feet of the Lord. So Gopakumar enters the palace and he mistakenly he, he sees Bart and he thinks Bart is Ramchandra because of such a such fabulous opulence beautiful wife who's a plenary portion of Lakshmi so she appears just like mother Sita he sees all the principal servants of Lord Ramachandra there so he assumes Ram Ram it's actually Bart and Bart's very embarrassed what he's saying <laughs> I'm just Ram's servant. Then Hanuman comes and says, come with me. And they leave that palace and enter deeper into Ayodhya. And there, Gopakumar sees the most amazing sight, Sri Ramchandra. Seated on his throne, and there's Sita Devi, there's Lakshman. As soon as Hanuman and Gopakumar enter Ram's palace. Hanuman immediately jumps up from the floor onto the throne with Ramchandra and his associates. Gopakumar notes that Ramchandra is even more beautiful than Lord Narayan. Ramchandra is naturally beautiful and even more beautiful because of his associates. Meanwhile, Gopakumar is noticing Hanuman. He's doing so many things at once. Fanning Ramchandra with Chamara, singing the glories of Ramchandra with palms folded, praising Ramchandra with wonderful prayers carrying a white umbrella, massaging the Lord's lotus feet, He's doing all this at once and not the slightest bit fatigued. Such are the glories of Hanuman. Gopakumar is overwhelmed. And then Ramchandra begins to speak to him. Bo Gopa Nandana Sahitama Sadhu Sadhu. <laughs> my dear son of a cowherd, Gopa Nandana, my best friend, Suhitama, Sadhu Sadhu, well done, excellent, well done. By showing such affection, you have conquered me. Now just relax. Enough with your long journey to get to Ayodhya. Enough with all these formalities, the stiff respect. Just relax, at ease. <laughs> I'm always controlled by such pure love as yours. I'm under your control. So how can I be the object of your reverence? Then the Lord ordered Hanuman, raise him up from the ground. <laughs> Gokupamara is thinking, this is the height of the fulfillment of my desires. 
This is more than I ever dreamed of. I've traveled throughout all the material and spiritual universes. I've never been so fully satisfied. He reports that I stayed there in Ayodhya for some time in my own dress as a cowherd boy. And the fullness of bliss that I tasted melted my heart. So you might say, well, he served Lord Narayan for some time in Vaikuntha, fanning him and pushing his swing. He's now serving Lord Ramchandra for some time in Ayodhya. But what happened to Dwarka? Why did he stay in Ayodhya? The explanation given is that he was enchanted and forgot everything, intoxicated by natural ecstasy at the feet of Lord Ramchandra. It wouldn't last. Gopakumar saw how strict Ramachandra was in executing the Dharma Shastras. This is an advanced point. That observation implied that the Lord in Ayodhya was not free to display the highest extreme of compassion for his devotees as he shows in more spontaneous realms, especially Braj. So suddenly Gopakumar is starting to feel and express dissatisfaction that will, the dissatisfaction that will push him further, farther on his journey. He says, but I did not see the unique sweetness I had found within the varied playful pastimes of my worshipful deity's lotus feet, nor did I find his special mercy. In other words, Lord Gopal has pastimes that Ramachandra doesn't. Remember those four qualities that Krishna doesn't share with anyone? Not Brahma, not Shiva, not even Narayan. What are those four qualities? Venu Madhurya, the sweetness of his flute playing. Lila Madhurya, the sweetness of his pastimes. Rupa Madhurya, the sweetness of his beauty. And Premam Madhurya. He's always surrounded by intimate loving affairs. So Kopa Kumara noticed Where's the flute playing that attracts the universe and enchants the gopis? In contrast to that, Gopakumar's relationship with Lord Ramachandra was more formal. So even though he's in Ayodhya, he seems unhappy. Now be careful about that unhappiness. That so-called unhappiness is the product of pure love for the Supreme Lord. It's actually unalloyed transcendental ecstasy. <clears throat> Hanuman was counseling him. Like, you've got to understand, Lord Ram. Uh, <laughs> understand Ram's humility, simplicity, respectfulness. So Hanuman was <laughs> bolstering Gopal Kumar, <laughs> giving him counsel. Like, and Gopal Kumar would be swayed. He says, by the force of my previous spiritual practices, the land of Braja would impose itself upon my heart, along with a yearning for its special pastimes and mercy. When Sri Hanuman, the best of counselors, would notice this, he would save me, quote unquote, by encouraging me with diverse, clever arguments. So in other words, Gopal Kumar is hankering for the sweet life of Brajabhumi and think about leaving Ayodhya. And Hanuman would detect that and make all endeavors to rescue Gopal Kumar, keep him in Ayodhya. 
So in this way, Gopal Kumar stayed for a long time without leaving. What finally happened? Lord Ram himself stopped all this repetitive discontent and appeasement. Discontent by Gopal Kumar, appeasement by Hanuman. Lord Ram himself stepped in. Out of compassion and knowing the heart of everyone, the mind of everyone in the world, Ram Chandra speaks with words of gentle affection to Gopakumar. Go to Dwarka and be happy. And he sent me off together with Jambavan, the chief of the bears. So only because Lord Ram Chandra personally asked Gopakumar to go to Dwarka was he able to leave. Why? Lord Ram knew Gopakumar is a worshipper of Madan Gopal, Gopaladev. And therefore he would never be satisfied completely in Ayodhya, even after tasting supreme ecstasy. And in spite of Hanuman's merciful counseling. Only by going to Dwarka and points beyond would Gopakumar be happy. So in conclusion, the Supreme Lord rarely sends someone out of his abode, but this time he did so for the happiness of his devotee. Who is more expert in caring for devotees than the Supreme Personality of Godhead? So I thank you for indulging me in <laughs> trying to dive deep into the ocean of Brihad Bhagavatamrita on the appearance day of Lord Ramchandra. I didn't expect to go on this long, but <laughs> what can be done? I see a few questions. I'll try to deal with them. Mm. So I hear that things are clicking in and out. Connection is clicking in and out. Sorry, but the whole thing will be online, available. For those of you who are having trouble hearing because of internet overload, as everyone's online during this coronavirus crisis. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.